There was a time when Tyson Chandler was considered a total bust. And I'm not talking about people who just throw out the word bust without giving young players a chance to prove themselves. Chandler was legitimately considered a bust. At the end of the day, this is a guy who's had a very unorthodox NBA journey. He's simultaneously a unique center for his era, yet also sported a very basic skill set for a center. In the early 2000s, when you drafted a 7 foot tall big man, especially with the number 2 pick, you expect them to dominate. You expect them to overpower people like Shaq and bully everyone in the paint. Early in his career, the main reason why Chandler was looked down on was that he wasn't dominating. He was playing okay, but definitely not what everyone expected. He was able to shed that bus label by changing the way he played, and changing everyone's perception of his game, and changed what it means to play center. How's it going folks? My name's Andy, and today, let's talk about Tyson Chandler. But before we start, if you want to protect yourself from your internet provider stealing and manipulating your data, it's time to get a VPN. With super fast servers in 59 different countries and double data encryption, NordVPN allows you to connect to a server of your choice and keep yourself completely anonymous. It's compatible with most operating systems, and there's even a Google Chrome extension as well, which allows you to quickly turn it on and off at your liking. NordVPN offers unlimited bandwidth, 24-7 customer support, and my favorite part, you can access Netflix in different regions, where they offer different shows. For example, Netflix UK offers Rick and Morty, while Netflix US does not. All you gotta do is connect to a UK server and bam, you're good to go. Use my code ANDYHOOPS or click the link below to get 68% off a 2 year plan, plus 1 additional month free. This is a special limited time offer so don't miss it. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video, and let's get started. In 2001, the center position was defined by two different categories. Shaq, and players trying to stop Shaq. That's it. Shaq absolutely dominated this era, and at his absolute peak, nobody could stop him. Nobody. This created a trend where teams would sign and play rather mediocre players with good size, just to try and body him up. He had the Jason Collins of the world, role players basically thrown onto the court to take a beating. He also had better players like Dikembe Mutombo or Marcus Camby who were phenomenal defensive players, but their role remained the same, to stop the opposing team's center while not really providing much offensive value. Not only that, but these centers typically struggled out on the perimeter as well. An exception would be Ben Wallace, who was very versatile, but he struggled offensively. Basically, at this time, with the exception of Shaq, the center position had a huge void. There was only a small handful of good players, but they all had glaring weaknesses. It was by far the weakest position in the early 2000s. So now, it's time for the 2001 NBA Draft. This would be a very interesting class, because a couple of high schoolers were projected to go very high. In fact, the top four picks of the draft did not even play college basketball, and all four of them were centers. It was expected that this draft would revive the position. For Chandler, everyone thought so highly of him. He was a ridiculous athlete, very long arms, quick feet, and expected to develop into a superstar. Some believed he should have been the first pick. The hype was real. In fact, the Bulls immediately offered a 22-year-old Elton Brand, who just put up 20 and 10 in the past two seasons. Can you imagine if a trade like that happened today? If a team traded a 22-year-old averaging 20 and 10 for an 18-year-old high schooler? They'd get so much flack. It's crazy. Well, actually, back then, it wasn't that crazy. That's how much everyone believed in the Chandler hype. Additionally, the Bulls also drafted Eddie Curry two spots later, so now their goal was to rebuild around these high school big men. It did not work. 
In his first five seasons, Chandler greatly underachieved. Despite getting ample playing time, he just wasn't dominating how he should. He scored on only 36% of his post-ups. The Bulls tried to force-feed him the ball, but he wasn't getting any better. Occasionally, he'd do a nice spin move or drop step, but for the most part, he struggled. His overall efficiency was pretty bad, especially for a guy who spends most of his time in the paint, and opposing defenses don't even pay attention to him. All of the concerns, all of the negative descriptors of his game prior to the draft were all coming into fruition. He was too weak, too raw, too lanky, not enough tact or skill to make use of his exceptional physical gifts. Most importantly, he was too quiet. He didn't possess any leadership qualities or communication skills necessary to lead a team's defense. Six years into the NBA, it was quite clear that he wasn't destined to be this almighty center we hoped for. Whether it's a mentality issue or talent issue, he was thrown into the same category as Kwame Brown, a bust. However, that would slowly change. By 2007, Chandler found himself in New Orleans. His game started to revamp itself. Instead of forcing himself to be the go-to guy, he embraced his new role. On a team with all-stars like Chris Paul and David West, Chandler became the perfect supporting player, filling in all the holes the team needed him to fill. On offense, he no longer thought of himself as a guy who needs to touch the ball in the post. Instead, he stuck to what he was good at, catching lobs and finishing pick and rolls. It also helped when he got Chris Paul feeding him. Chandler became the most efficient player in the league at finishing pick and rolls, even ahead of Amari Stoudemire, although on a lower volume. On defense, Chandler anchored the paint, leading the Hornets to the seventh best defensive rating in the league. A remarkable feat considering who he was playing next to. Peja Stojakovic and David West were not the best defenders. But that's fine, Chandler covered them. Whenever they missed a rotation or got blown by, Chandler had their backs. He also became more vocal, something he learned from Chris Paul. Chandler routinely called out switches and picks and became much more involved. Instead of focusing on defending just the opposing center, he focused on defending everybody. Herbert Williams, a former player and coach, clearly noticed his development. As he stated, He is totally different, a big, agile guy that anchors your defense and talks, chattering up the whole team. Normally, you're begging guys to do that. He does it with no problem. He even does it on the bench, and hopefully it gets contagious to where everybody talks. Then, when Herbert was asked who did Chandler remind him of, You know, right now I can't think of one. Maybe I can if you come back tomorrow. That's the thing, although his box score numbers were not super impressive, his impact was ridiculous. He checked all the boxes a team wants out of a center, without actually putting up a monstrous number of points. Regardless, even with all of these improvements, Chandler's reputation was shot. While his teammates and his peers knew how good he was, he couldn't shake off that bus label. At least, not until he arrived in Dallas. The 2010-11 Mavs unexpectedly made a massive playoff run. While it was Dirk who led the way, Chandler was the guy they needed to push him over the top. In previous years, he was exactly what the Mavs were missing, a tough, defensive-minded player to complement Dirk's lack of defense. Chandler was widely regarded as the missing piece, the unsung hero, who lifted the Mavs from a competitive playoff team to a championship team. It was in Dallas where he finally got the recognition he deserved. Except, apparently, it wasn't enough for Mark Cuban. Chandler was not re-signed by the Mavs, at least not for now, as they really wanted to try and get Dwight Howard. They failed to do that. Chandler would sign with the Knicks, who offered him a four-year $58 million deal. Shortly after, he would win Defensive Player of the Year in 2012 and be named an All-Star in 2013. 
At the age of 30, Chandler made the first and only All-Star appearance of his entire NBA career. It took over 10 years for Chandler to reach this stage, to gain the respect that he deserved for not only rebranding himself as a great player, but also popularizing a new trend of centers. Centers who don't need to dominate in scoring, but ones who can strictly anchor the paint and lead their teams on defense with leadership and guidance. And on offense, provide value for being super efficient pick and roll finishers. While the NBA trends toward a perimeter dominated league, centers like these are more valuable than ever. DeAndre Jordan, Miles Turner, Clint Capella, Rudy Gobert, Steven Adams. These guys would be seen as lesser players in the past, but nowadays, they're ridiculously valuable to their teams because they know their roles, and they dominate in those roles. Now, I'm not saying Chandler was the first guy to start this trend, but the emergence of the modern day center was popularized by his role on the 2011 Mavs. The once disengaged, disparaged player has reformed himself. While he might have not lived up to expectations, he still utilized his strengths to his best potential. Nowadays, nobody thinks he's a bust anymore. But for his high school comrades from the same draft, yeah, it didn't work out for them. Anyway, that's all folks, that sums up the video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section about Tyson Chandler and his evolution as a player. Do you think players like him are undervalued in the NBA today? They definitely don't get as much recognition as the stars, but I think they're just as important. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.